Hi, my name's Amelia, and thanks for joining our announcement loop today. Here are some things that we would like to highlight. The Elisha House Baby Bottle Campaign is now online. You can visit the link at the bottom of the screen to find out ways that you can contribute. Also, if you're like me and you've been saving up your change all year for this campaign, you can contact them through that link to find out ways that you can get that to them. Also, is there anything that we can pray with you about? If you have any prayer requests or praise reports, please feel free to connect with us on our website, wellspringchurch.ca slash prayer. We'd love to be able to stand and believe God for all of the great things that he'll do in your lives. We'd also like to thank everyone for their ongoing con contributions to the ministry here at Wellspring. If you would like to contribute in any way, you can go to our website, wellspringchurch.ca slash donate and find all the ways that you can donate there through e-transfer, credit card, visa debit, or by mail. And if you're new here at Wellspring, please don't feel any obligation to give. We are just so happy that you're joining us today. Also, if you have any questions or would like to connect with us, you can reach out to us on our website, wellspringchurch.ca slash contact or message us on any of our social media platforms. And we'd love to connect with you there. Thanks for joining us today. Now back to our announcement loop. and welcome to Wellspring Community Church live online. My name is Rachel Thompson and I'm so glad that you could join us today. Earlier this morning I was reading the scripture found in Psalm 20 verse 6. It says, I know that the Lord saves his anointed with the saving strength of his right hand. He will listen and hear and answer from his holy heaven. I just want to encourage you with this thought today that wherever you are, the Lord hears your voice as you're worshiping, as you're praying, and as we come together online to come before God and to meet with him. He is listening and he will answer us. I'm glad you could be with us this morning. I pray that God will bless each and every one of you today.
Again, to you our hearts, to you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire, you alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down on us today. today for who you are. But we welcome you in our lives, Lord. We're amazed by who you are. You are matchless in grace and mercy. There is nowhere we can hide from your love. You are steadfast, never failing. You are faithful. All creation is in awe of who you are. You're the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever for 
eternity But we will sing of all you've done Sing that last line again For eternity We will sing of all you've done We sing God with us God for us Nothing can come against No one can stand between us God with us God for us Nothing can come against No one can stand between us Your heart, it moves with compassion There is life, there is healing in your love You're the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit For eternity we will sing of all you've done One more time For eternity we will sing of all you've done We sing God with us God for us Nothing can come again
God for us Nothing can come against No one can stand between us God with us God for us Nothing can come against No one can stand between us Praise is yours, and the praise is yours, and the praise is yours. You're the one we bow before, reigning over us as we lift you up. You will reign forever. And the praise is yours, and the praise is yours, you're the one we bow before, reigning over us as we lift you up. just so uh, enamored by your bigness, by your character, by all that you display, display in your creation, display in the things that you have gifted us with, like song and the ability to express our hearts to you. But when we do that, Lord, we are again captivated by your majesty, about, by your strength, by your grace, by your love. And so, God, we again come today and we are so grateful for, for these times and these moments. And uh, just was wanted to share a verse with you this morning. And it says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And it's so easy for us, it's so easy for us to get our thoughts on anything and everything else. 
But when we stop and when we remember, when we pursue the presence of God, when we pursue God's heart, when we pursue His character, when we pursue all that He is, it stops. Our thoughts become fixed on the God of all, the one that is with us at all times, that we never have to be afraid that he is ever gonna leave us or is ever gonna forsake us. He is with us and nothing can separate us from his love. And we, we just want to so encourage you in this season of life just to continue to fix your eyes on him and to fix your thoughts on him and to set your heart on him. I'm gonna read that again and it says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And so Lord, this morning, I just pray for every person whose thoughts are scattered, whose even heart is troubled, who is just where, where life in this season is just so unsettling, Lord. I pray that you would just bring about your peace as they fix their eyes on you, that they would see again today, that they would get a glimpse today that they could be able to trust you and put their hope in you and fix their thoughts and their eyes on you. God, we're so grateful, so grateful for just these moments where you continue to remind us of your goodness and your character and your greatness and you settle us in your very presence. Lord, we worship you. And just pray that wherever you are today and as we continue to be able to just be able to do life together in this context, that God would speak directly to your heart and that, that you wouldn't guard your heart from him, but that you would open up your heart to allow him to speak into the very depths of your life, that he would bring about his life in you and through you. Well, bless you wherever you are. Thanks, Noah and Amy, uh, for leading us together in worship this morning. It's just been great to be able to, to be together. And I just pray that, again, God would just speak to you in your, our, the rest of our time together as God speaks through his word and through the message from our lead pastor, Mark. God bless you. Thanks again for being with us. And now to the rest of our time together. Well, good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well today. Hope that you have had a good week, a pleasant week, and maybe you've even had opportunity to take advantage of some of the things that have begun to open up. Maybe you got to shop at a store that you've been waiting to get to, or just even be out and about a little bit uh, as we're beginning to go through these reopening phases. Uh, I think there's some excitement, there's some relief, um, maybe a little bit of joy there. There could also be some fear and some trepidation, but uh, let's just trust that God is leading uh, our governmental leaders, and we know that the heart of the King is in the hand of the Lord, so we can trust that God is helping them help us as we reintegrate and reconnect. Anyway, um, I want to talk. I'm, first, I'm going to pray, I guess. I'll, I'll pray first, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get uh, right into our uh, dialogue. I guess it's not a dialogue if I'm the only one talking, unless you're writing in the chat room. But anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity again to connect, to worship together, to hear your word, to grow, to learn. And I pray, God, that wherever we are in our journey right now, that you would strengthen us, encourage us, move us forward, maybe challenge us, but that you would equip us for all that we need for life and godliness. Lord, I pray that no matter where we're at right now, we would encounter you in a way that does those things, Lord. And that whether we're sitting in a living room or sitting in a car or sitting in a dining room or a kitchen, uh, whether we've got earbuds on or we're sitting with a whole family, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and be teacher to our hearts and your word to come alive for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So it's going to be a little wonky here, first of all, at the beginning, because um, kind of our theme for today has to do with F words. Now, I know that whenever we hear F words, we, our mind tends to go a particular way. But um, I want you to think about maybe what your favorite F word is and post it on social, you know, maybe like 
French fries is like a double F word. And I don't know, maybe some of the kids would go, yeah, French fries. Or maybe fishing might be a favorite F word of yours. Or for the ladies, maybe a facial would be a great F word for you. There might be you know, fish because you like to eat it or whatever. So think of your favorite F word. Let's let's post them up there and see what kind of uh, funky terms that we can come up and and uh, and that we can follow through to see what everybody is putting up there on the post and we can have fun watching it. And yeah, anyway, this could get a little bit crazy. I think I should move forward and try to move away from the funnies so that we can forge ahead and uh, and move into our actual content. Now, the reason I'm asking about all of these F words is because the Bible uses certain words, uh, you know, that in our language are, are words that, that are F words, or teach certain principles. And there are, there are F words to embrace and F words to avoid. And so we're going to talk about some of those things today. And what I want to do is frame right at the beginning. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right at the beginning kind of what our concluding mark is, because it's going to be the point of reference where we're going to resolve all of these other things. And so just so that you know in advance, the, the, the big F word that we're going to talk about today is going to be the word faith. And as we talk about the word faith, we're going to hinge it on on three other particular F words that we're going to talk about that could be detrimental to our soul and detrimental to our lives. And at the other end of it, we'll talk about how faith counteracts those things. Now, if you're a note taker, be forewarned. We have a lot more scripture than we normally do. And uh, I've, I wouldn't say restrained myself, but given the nature of how we've been going through things, I haven't tried to dump top piles of scripture. Some of you know that when, um, when I am teaching, you know, in the, in the uh, regular church context, uh, I can tend to be more teachy than preachy. And because of that, a lot of times um, I load you down with lots of scriptures because I like to make sure that if I'm making a point, I'm making a biblical point. And I like to be clear to differentiate between what might be my opinion and what the Bible really says. So we're going to use some, some you know, good bit of scripture today. And so our first F word, first of all, I mean, other than faith, faith is our container word today. But my first F word is, is, is the word frustration. Now, ah. <sighs> Have you ever tried to glue something and it won't stay together or it lasts just a little while and it comes apart again? And part of that is using the right glue for the right material. But my favorite slash hated thing is a lot of times when you're gluing plastics, when plastic breaks, the the, the cure-all for plastic is crazy glue. And crazy glue is a really unique glue, and in some cases it can work really great, and in other cases it just serves to get your hopes up so that you could be disappointed shortly thereafter. I think they call it crazy glue because of what it does to the user. It drives the user crazy. So anyway, I don't know about you, but I have had that frustration. I have had those moments where I have glued something together. I thought, okay, this will hold. Okay, it's doing okay. Let's be nice to it. Let's give it 24 hours before we put it any stress on it. And then it comes apart again. And then you try something else and something else. And sooner or later, you're going out and buying the replacement for it that you didn't want to spend the money on to start with. So anyway, the feeling that I experience, and I'm sure you do when that happens, is frustration. And it's that feeling like you're you're not getting where you want to be you're not getting the outcome that you want to achieve. It's, it's like revving your engine in neutral. I don't know if you've ever done that where you thought the car was in gear, but you had just popped it into neutral for some reason. And then you take your foot off the brake and hit the gas and it just goes vroom and then nothing happens. 
And frustration is kind of like revving on neutral. It's just, you can rev all you want, but you're not getting anywhere. You're not getting to where you want to go. And we experience these things. We experience frustration when things don't turn out the way we intend or the way we hope. And ultimately, frustration happens when we're not in control or when we're, like we feel like we're not in control. Now, frustration is an internal form of anger, is really what it is. It's, it's internally, you're angry because it's not going the way you want it to go or going the way you think it should go. And so, and it can become fuel for external anger. I don't know if you've ever been trying to fix a part or assemble something or build something or work on something and it's not going, it's not going, you're getting more and more frustrated. And then you have that moment where you have that urge to pick whatever it is up and throw it across the room. Now, hopefully that's not your children, but that you get the urge to go like, ah, just forget this thing, right? And it's always better to get up and just kind of walk away. Uh, it's far less counterproductive because you, know, you usually end up breaking something else when you do it the other way. So I want to read Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, because it talks about anger. It talks about having anger, but not acting on anger. And it talks about not letting anger take residence in our lives and be an ongoing part of our lives. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Now, what you find here is that anger ultimately doesn't produce life. It doesn't produce good. There's another verse in James that says that man's anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God requires or asks of us. And so frustration shouldn't be something that is controlling our lives. It's not something that, that is meant to be a core driver in our emotions and in our behaviors and in our thought patterns. We all get frustrated at times, but what do you do with that frustration? How do you handle that frustration? And how do you resolve that frustration? We'll talk about that later on when we talk about faith. The second word I want to talk about, the second F word that I want to talk about, is the word fatigue. Now, I am sure that some of you have been tired. Maybe some of you are more rested than you've ever been because you have been working tired for a long time and you've had some downtime and you're resting, you're caught up. But what I've discovered both for myself and with conversations with other people is that uh, this staying at home thing can produce a little bit of bad habits like the tendency to stay up late and the tendency to actually get less sleep than more. And we end up tired. Now, there's nothing evil or wrong about being tired, but I want to talk about a specific type of fatigue, more like a soul type of fatigue. There's a difference between being tired and being weary. They're both a form of fatigue, but being tired, you can have a great long day's work and come home tired, but you're, you're, you're tired, but you're good. You know, you're ready to go to bed. You're ready to get rest. But when you're weary, it's a fatigue of the soul. And it's something that erodes. It's something that pulls us down. It's something that disheartens us. And so, couple of passages of scripture I want to look at. First of all, we want to look at Galatians 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let's not become weary. And, and that's this, this word that, that is this fatigue of the soul. It, it's it's it's, it's a disengaging word. It's a word of losing strength, losing heart, losing tenacity. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.1 translates it with a different, in a different way. It says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. And that, that term, lose heart, is that very same word again that we're talking about that's a weariness, that's a fatigue. 
And I find it interesting in this particular context in 2 Corinthians 4, if you were to go, maybe this can be your homework assignment, but if you were to go and read the rest of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, and you hear this guy, Paul, who's written this letter, this apostle's written this letter, and he's talking about his integrity, he's talking about not giving up, and then he starts talking about his hardships, and he says, You know, we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in in despair. We're we're knocked down, but we're not abandoned. We're persecuted and and, but but yeah, persecuted but not abandoned and and knocked down but not destroyed. And he he keeps going about talking about the the hardships of life, the difficulties of his life, but he started it by saying. Even though all this stuff is going on, we don't lose heart. Why? He says, because we've received this ministry. In other words, he didn't become weary because his life was anchored in understanding who he was called to be. His life was anchored in the bigger picture and not in the moments that he was experiencing. And again, when we come back to that and talk about this with faith, we'll unpack it a little bit more. But really, it's about not letting the circumstances determine who you are. Because this weariness becomes an erosion of the soul and it wears at your character and it wears at your motivation. And so those are things that we want to work really hard to avoid in our lives. And the third F word I want to talk about, and this one's actually a four-letter F word, and that is the word fear, okay? The word fear. And fear is often an expectation of an evil outcome. Okay? It's something that you perceive threatens you or those that you love. Okay, Now, what happens with fear is that fear does something inside of us and it shifts us and it moves us toward self-preservation. Okay? Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, if you, if you see your toddler, you're, you're out in the yard and you see your toddler running toward the street you will dash and grab and swoop and maybe even just like with with great force violently stop them from going into the road. Why? Because fear of them getting hurt on the street motivates you to act quickly. And that's not a bad thing. That's the right kind of self-preservation and family preservation that we're, we're made to have. But the... The, this self-preservation response can also be a bad thing. And especially in this time, because um, self-preservation can move into selfishness or self-protection, self-centeredness. So we end up not being unwilling to share with other people because we're afraid of lacking ourselves, for example. That's where you know, a fear of lack kills our spirit of generosity because it becomes about me. And fear can cripple people and stop them from walking in love. You see, fear actually attacks our capacity to walk, walk in love. When we, when we walk in fear, everything revolves around us and ourselves. When we walk in love, we're able to see past ourselves to what is for others and what is for their good. And so fear attacks love. It actually attacks love. And so in this day and age, in this day that we're in, if we get too caught up in all the fears that are out here and things that are being said, then what happens is we have this retreat mentality. We have this uh, you know, they used to use an old phrase called circle the wagons. It comes from the old Western movies where, where people would circle the wagons to protect themselves from attack. And, and we get this circle the wagons mentality where it's like, shut her down, keep everybody away and, you know, hold on to your stuff. And it, that's exactly the opposite of what love is. I want to read to you this passage of scripture. And this This passage actually has kind of become uh, somewhat of an anchor point for my own heart and my own life 
uh, ever since the, the epidemic hit the world and was declared and we started getting put into isolation and different things like that. And in all of that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk that breeds a lot of fear. And when, when I came across this scripture, it really set my heart at ease. And uh, let me put it this way. It put it, it put it in the right place. So let me just read it to you. You're wondering, what scripture, what scripture, what scripture? So Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 to 13 says this. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. He said... Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. And that really struck my heart because at my age now, um, I've lived through several different cycles of, of uh, theories, ideas, things, end times things. Uh, you know, in my own lifetime, according to what I've been told, Jesus has already returned at least four times. And if I would have believed it each time, that would have got me in some serious trouble. Um, Jesus will return, but... You know, I don't really know when, and neither do you. If you think you do, you're, you're, you don't. So anyway, but he says here, and, and I'll just kind of frame it for you. He said, what the point he's making is this, God's opinion, God's truth, God's word should be the loudest voice in your heart and in your life. I watched a, a very interesting documentary this past week about, um, they're, they're called the Free Burma Rangers. And this fellow is a, is a former uh, U.S. Ranger, and he formed a group of people to go into Burma during, during the, uh, the Civil War. Well, the Civil War has been going on for years and years, many, many years. But to, to bring in medics, to help them, to, to, to rescue people and all these different things. And there's, there's footage of this guy being, you know, there and in Iraq and being right in harm's way with RPGs being launched and bullets deflecting nearby. And he knew that he could die at any time. And he put on a video, a vlog with him and his wife just recently during this time. And, and he said something very interesting. He said, you know, he said, I know there's a lot of fear about COVID-19 and different things like that. But he said, you know, I'll tell you the truth. He says... I'm more afraid to sin than I am of the virus. And it caught my heart. You know, should we be, should we be more concerned about not sinning and about not walking in love than what might happen in the future or what might happen out of all of this? Should we not be fearing the Lord more than fearing all of the other stuff? That is going on. It doesn't mean we ignore it. It doesn't mean that we don't inform ourselves. It doesn't mean that we don't use wisdom and all of those different things. But what, what's holy in your heart? What strikes fear to your heart? I should be more afraid to disobey God and not walk in love than I should be afraid of what might happen. I just want to make this, this just really quick comment, and then we're going to move on to all the good news, all right? The book of Revelation, if you've read it or not, I don't know, you know, but the book of Revelation, if you take a step back and look at the actual context of the writing it, of it, John was exiled on an island. He wrote the letter to the churches. In that letter, there was all kinds of apo what we call apocalyptic literature, symbols and coded messages and things that if you, if you didn't know what was going on in the day, you could misinterpret what he was saying. But he did all of these things to write to the churches. But here's the thing. The core driver behind the book of Revelation was that it was written to encourage persecuted believers. It was written to encourage them that God was in control and that no matter how bad it would get, the outcome was already settled by God and the victory 
belongs to his people. Unfortunately, people have turned it into fear-mongering instead, and they've lost the real point. The point of the book of Revelation is that we don't have to live in fear because we know that it's what God declares in heaven that happens. And it's he, he gets the final say in all of this. And no matter how bad it looks, God is still God. Our salvation is secure. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so even the book of Revelation was not meant to bring fear. It was meant to bring encouragement, strength, and perseverance into our hearts and into our lives. So the next time you read the book of Revelation, listen for the encouragement. Look for the picture that shows God is not intimidated by a single thing that happens because he's the one who calls the final shots and has to set, settled the final outcome. All right, let's talk about faith now because ultimately faith is antidotal is a cure for these other F words. And so we're going to start with, you know, very commonly read verse, but we want to read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. If you were to read all of Hebrews 11, it builds the context around this statement. And it talks about people being able to do things and obey God without any proof that it was going to turn out a certain way. It talks about people who were willing to sacrifice their lives and who knew they were not even going to see the outcome of their faith until the end, until Jesus comes back and makes things right. But all of them were commended because they lived a life that was confident. They lived a life that was sure about what was not visible in the situation. Faith is, faith is the basis of our Christian walk. Faith sees past the present. Faith sees past the situation. Faith sees past the data. Faith sees the truth of what God says. Faith is the guarantee of our future with God. It is the basis of our righteousness in Christ. It is the guarantee of our security in Him. It is the shield that stops the attacks of the devil. It is the basis of our obedience to Christ. And faith is even the fuel behind love. Galatians 5, 6 says, The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. So faith is even the fuel behind love. And so it's amazing because faith becomes this foundation of our, our, our life in God and of our life in general, that we live a life with an assurance and a confidence that is not based on what we're seeing now, but based on what God says. Now, how do they, how does faith work with all of these? Well, let's go back to frustration. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Many of you probably know it, have memorized it, but let's read this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Understanding is an important thing for a lot of people. I remember sitting in math class and them telling us a formula and saying, when you do this, this will tell you that. And I remember in my mind saying, yeah, but I want to know why that formula works. I, want, I, don't, I don't just want the formula. I want to understand the formula. And I remember asking the teacher, I said, why does this formula work? And the teacher said, I think this was in grade 11. The teacher said, you don't know enough to understand it. But if you take it in grade 13, you will know the math behind the math and you will be able to understand why this formula works. I didn't really want to hear that answer. In the meantime, the math teacher said, I'm just asking you to accept it as true because it is. And in the future, you will understand it. <laughs> Life, I think a lot of times is like that. And God asks us to trust in Him when we don't understand. A, a phrase that Wendy and I have used, our own paraphrase of that verse, is that when life doesn't make sense, keep trusting God. He'll get us through it. And I was in a conversation earlier uh, this week 
Um, actually, it was the Zoom party last Sunday, and someone had made this comment. They said one of the things that they have been learning and growing in is this question, are you willing to relinquish your need to understand and simply trust God? Oh, that's a challenge. Because I don't know about you, but I want to understand everything. I want to know how things work, and I want to know why. And so, am I re- willing to relinquish my need to understand? You see, faith becomes more about trusting God for the outcomes than our own abilities to control them or to accomplish them. And so, the, the, the antidote to frustration is that oftentimes you're frustrated because things are not working and you don't know why or you can't figure it out. And the antidote to frustration is trust. It's faith. It's trusting in God. And it's saying, you know what? I don't have control over this and I don't even understand it. But I'm going to trust you, God, with all my heart. And I'm not going to lean on my own ability to figure it out. I'm going to submit to you and you will make my path straight. Let's talk about fatigue. I'm going to read a fairly lengthy passage here, but it's, again, a popular passage of Scripture. But when our soul is, is, is fatigued, when we are weary, we need strength from God. Not just physical strength, but strength of the soul. Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, first of all, it says that God doesn't get weary. And then it says that he gives power to the faint and to the weary. And he says those who wait for the Lord, and it's it's translated hope in one translation, it's translated wait in another. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting Hebrew word, but it has to do with an expectant waiting. So it's not just an issue of waiting, it's an issue of expectation. It's a faith word. It's a word that says, I don't see it yet, but I'm expecting and I'm believing. And people who put their trust and their faith in God, that's where we find our strength. That's where we, can, we, we are freed from weariness. Now, if you need rest, you need to get rest. But when your soul is weary, oftentimes it's because there's been a loss of perspective. And, and you, you begin to shrink back. But the Bible says in Hebrews 10, we're not those who shrink back and are destroyed. We're those who believe and are saved. Let's talk finally about fear. Another uh, longer passage as well. And uh, actually, I just partially quoted it. But in Hebrews 10, verses 35 to 39. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And my righteousness, uh, sorry, and but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure, ouch, in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Shrinking back is about fear. And, you know, this was written to the Hebrew Christians. They were being persecuted. If you read earlier on in chapter 10, their houses had been confiscated. People had lost their jobs. Their property had been taken from them. They were suffering in all kinds of ways. And they were really tempted to go back to Judaism and renounce Jesus just to get rid of all of the discomfort that they were experiencing. Listen, we've been going through all this stuff, but it doesn't even compare to some of the persecution that they went through and that other people in the world are still going through. 
And he says, listen, we need to live by faith. We need to persevere. We need to hold on to our confidence. Why? Because if we give in to fear, we shrink back. And when we shrink back, we're no longer trusting God. Again, we're, we're pulling back. We're circling the wagons. We're going into self-isolation. And it's no longer about who God is and what he can do. It's about us and what we can accomplish. And so, so the antidote to fear again, goes back to faith because we know that he's going to reward us for standing. He know, we know that he is pleased when we believe in him. It says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And that when we seek him, we need to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So I want to bring one scripture to tie all of this back together. In 2 Corinthians 4.1, Paul talked about not not losing heart. And then this last little bit here in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. So part through the chapter, he talks about his hardships. He talks about his difficulties. He talks about his challenges. And then, and all of that, he summarizes it in 17 and 18. For this light and momentary affliction, we would call it the worst thing ever. He calls it that. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See, you might be frustrated about things, You might be weary. You might have some soul fatigue. You you might be afraid. You might be dealing with some fear or you might be hearing things that are triggering fear in your life. But the way we counteract all of those things is by seeing things God's way. While we look not on the things that are seen because they're transient, but we focus our attention on the eternal unseen things. We focus our attention on God. We put our trust in Him. We, We remember that He has your life in His hands. He has your life in his hands. So no matter what happens, he has your life in his hands. And if everything goes sideways, he has your life in his hands. And if governments fall, he has your life in his hands. And if another pandemic comes that's even worse, he has your life in his hands. And this is the anchor for our soul. This is the thing that keeps us steady. It frees us from fear. It frees us from frustration. It frees us from fatigue, weariness of the soul. Because we have an anchor that we fix our eyes on the eternal. We don't get moved back and forth by everything that's going on around us. It's okay to know. But it's not okay to shrink back because you know. It's okay to be aware. But it's not okay to to react and respond according to what the world and, and everything else is being said around us because Jesus is our anchor. God's word is eternal, and that is the anchor for our soul. So, Father, I pray right now for each person watching. And, Lord, I pray that you would stabilize and strengthen their hearts, that you would build them up that you would open the eyes of the heart. Lord, I break the spirit of fear over people's hearts and lives right now, Lord. I pray you would give them discretion in what they watch and what they listen to, that they would not feed their hearts with fear. Lord, I pray for those who are weary and their souls are tired, Lord, and I pray that they would have an encounter with you, that their strength would be renewed, that their perspective would be restored, Lord God. Father, we just, we just pray for those who are frustrated, Lord, who just feel out of control. And Lord, I pray that their hearts would settle into trust in you, would settle into realizing that, that our lives are in your hands and nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would all be strengthened with power and might by your spirit in our inner being so that moving forward that we're not living out of frustration and fatigue and fear but we're living out of faith lord let faith be our f word lord in jesus name amen be strengthened be encouraged be challenged 
move forward, and let's act like we are more than conquerors. God bless you. Have yourself a great day. Hi, my name's Amelia, and thanks for joining our announcement loop today. Here are some things that we would like to highlight. The Elisha House Baby Bottle Campaign is now online. You can visit the link at the bottom of the screen to find out ways that you can contribute. Also, if you're like me and you've been saving up your change all year for this campaign, you can contact them through that link to find out ways that you can get that to them. Also, is there anything that we can pray with you about? If you have any prayer requests or praise reports, please feel free to connect with us on our website, wellspringchurch.ca slash prayer. We'd love to be able to stand and believe God for all of the great things that he'll do in your lives. We'd also like to thank everyone for their ongoing con contributions to the ministry here at Wellspring. If you would like to contribute in any way, you can go to our website, wellspringchurch.ca slash donate and find all the ways that you can donate there through e-transfer, credit card, visa debit, or by mail. And if you're new here at Wellspring, please don't feel any obligation to give. We are just so happy that you're joining us today. Also, if you have any questions or would like to connect with us, you can reach out to us on our website, wellspringchurch.ca slash contact or message us on any of our social media platforms. And we'd love to connect with you there. Thanks for joining us today. Now back to our announcement loop. Thank you.